And so Psalm chapter 8 starts out there in verse 1 and says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name <coughs> in all the earth, <coughs> who has set thy glory above the heavens. And, of course, you might notice there that heavens is plural. You know, he's saying that his glory is set above the heavens. And it's just a good time to kind of talk about the fact that, because do, people do get confused about this, especially people... Uh, in certain uh, <laughs> that run in certain circles and believe very strange things like the flat earth that uh, you know they have strange ideas about what the heavens are and the firmament is so you know as, as foolish as it seems like you have to bring up these days I am going to mention it just because of the fact that it's out there we've had to deal with it in the past but the heavens here you say why is it plural it's because of the fact that the heavens refer to what you know we would call the sky and then of course space you know outer space and then, of course, there's the heavens where God's throne is. So when he's saying there that he has set thy, that he has set thy glory above the heavens, it, it's not that God is you know, somehow outside of, of all you know, existence or something. It, it, the, the thought here is this, is that you know, God does have a place where he dwells. You know, there is a physical location. Now, we don't understand exactly how that all works. You know, if it's you know, some kind of interdimensional thing or something like that, where exactly is God's throne? Well, it says here that it's above the heavens, plural, meaning it's above the sky that we see, and it's even beyond the visible universe that we can behold. God is above all of that. And exactly how that works, I don't know. I'm looking forward to finding out, though, when I get there. So it'll be interesting to know once we get to heaven. But if you would, keep something in Psalms 8. Go over to Genesis chapter 1, because it is important to understand, you know, to, to bunk foolish false doctrine that, you know, the sky and the, and the space are referred to as the heavens or also as the firmaments. Okay, they're also referred to each as the firmament. In Genesis chapter 1, we'll read in verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament which divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So you can see there he's saying, Let the dry waters gather together, which were, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 9, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. Right. So he's talking about the land and the seas you know, being gathered together. Under the heaven, you know, meaning under the sky. Under the, so this is one of the first heavens that we're talking about, the heaven which is the sky. And God called, verse 10, called the dry land earth, and the gathering together the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Let's jump down to verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. So now we're talking about space, right? He's talking about the sky, or excuse me, he's talking about the stars, the moon, the sun, so on and so forth. He's saying, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. He's not talking about you know, this, this foolish notion that there's this firmament, this like this dome over the earth, and that the sun is actually a lot smaller than we think, and the stars are all contained within this dome that is surrounding a flat earth, okay? I know it's crazy, but this is something that's taking off. This is something that's, you know, has, has, a lot of people are believing, even in Baptist churches. And, uh, you know, I, I don't subscribe to it, and I think it's a foolish thing to, to, uh, to a belief to hold to. And it's not even biblical, okay? And we'll see here that in a minute. And people turn to these passages and say, well, see there, God said that the firmament, you know, was that the lights were in the firmament. But yeah, but he's referring to the firmament of space, okay? He's referring, referring to not, you know, the, the sky. He's moved on, and he's talking, and, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And it says in verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. So this is obviously the stars that we're talking about here. And let them be uh, for, uh, verse 15, And let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Here's the sun. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And of course, every time I read that, he made the stars also. It's such a great phrase that's just in the scripture. Just, God just kind of throws that in there. Oh, and he made the stars also. You know, we look at the stars and behold them and are mystified by them and just we wonder about them and scientists study them and they've developed these huge telescopes to look at them and they give them weird names like H7462-93. You know, and they try to measure where they are and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? God just says, yeah, and I made those also. And in the laser in the scripture, he's talking about the fact that, you know, he knows every, he's given every star a name. You know, and we can't even, they're like the sands of the sea. We couldn't even count them. We don't even know how many, 
there truly are. And God just kind of on a whim there. I just love that phrase. And he made the stars also. And just kind of wings it out there. You know, what's amazing about this, and this psalm kind of ties in with the psalm. He's, you know, he's talking about, talk, uh, starts out saying how excellent God's name is in the earth, how he's exalted his, his throne above the heavens. But then he goes on later, as we'll read, and he talks about, you know, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And that kind of ties in here. You know, God set, makes this statement here in Genesis, and he made the stars also, which we are just um, perplexed and amazed by. You know, we, we stand in awe of God's creation. And God just kind of throws it out there. And, and then what is, but what does he go on to talk about the rest of the book? He goes on to talk about mankind. He goes on to talk about, you know, specific nations and people. You know, the stars aren't his, you know, his, his primary focus. God doesn't just go on bragging about everything that he's accomplished, although he'd probably be perfectly justified in doing so. He goes on to talk about me and you and mankind. You know, and I've always kept that in mind when I read that phrase, how amazing it is that God just kind of mentions that and it takes the time to focus on us, you know, because we are his creation too. And no matter, you know, anything that we look at in creation and are amazed by, like, you know, the stars and the firmament, the glory of the heavens and all the creatures and so on and so forth, we have to remember that we are God's crowning achievement in creation when you think about it. We are the last things that God made. We are made in his image, you know, and, we sh and, there, and I bring that up because there's a tendency today, you know, amongst people to exalt, you know, you know, other creatures above man. They want to make, you know, they want to say, you know, dogs are better than humans or something like that, or, you know, we're, the earth is more important than us or something like that. You know, they want to exalt Mother Earth over mankind. Well, you know, God's the exact opposite. Yeah, I made the stars also. Let's talk about man now because that's who he's concerned with, you know, because we're made in his image. So don't ever let anybody, you know, downplay your importance to God. It says there, uh, let's pick it back up in verse 17. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the dar darkness. And God saw that it was good. Verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly and move uh, and the, the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So, you know, this is a great, because one of the things they'll say, oh, that dome is what's called the firmament. Yeah, but the Bible, you know, the flat earthers, but the Bible says that it's an open firmament that the birds fly in. And you know, birds cannot fly in solid objects. You know, if you, anyone who's had a large plate glass window knows this is true. You ever go out and you'll see the imprint of some bird. I remember I, I, <laughs> I knew somebody that had one and they, a hawk flew into it. And hawk's a big bird and you could make out the wings, the beak, the head. It was just like, it was comical. You know, it was like something out of a cartoon. You could see where this giant hawk is chasing a sparrow or something and just left this big greasy, you can see have like greasy feathers imprint and they didn't wash that window for a long time and everyone, we were kind of like, wow, that's cool, you know. But the point being is that, you know, the, the birds are flying in the firmament. You know, they're flying where? In the sky. That's what the firmament is. The firmament is the heaven. The firmament is the sky. And, and now look at Genesis chapter 2 because this kind of seals the deal. It says there, the, it's, you know, it gives us the, the creation of the stars and the sky, and, and, excuse me, the, the space and the sky, the heavens, right? And that's why he says there in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens. So he's talking about two different heavens in Genesis chapter 1. He's talking about the sky and then he's talking about space. He's not talking about space being contained within the firmament of what we would call the sky. Otherwise, it would need to be plural, okay? Otherwise, that's all one system. God says that there's the firmament of the sky, and then there's the firmament of space. These are two different uh, heavens that he's referring to. And, of course, the third heaven is where God is. That's his throne. That's the heaven that, uh, you know, the saved go to. <coughs> Another, uh, go over to Psalms chapter 7, or back to Psalms 8. We'll be in Psalm 2 for, for a second. You're right there, but anyway, but... You know, another proof of this would be the fact that if you remember when Absalom was fleeing on his, on his mule and he had that big head of hair that got caught in the, in the bow of the bow of the oak. Remember that story? And he got stuck and he was hanging and he was, he was you know, his big old head of hair and he's just dangling in, in, uh, from that tree. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 18 that he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. You know, so what, he's, what is he referring to? The sky and the ground, right? And that's, it's again referring to the fact that the sky is heaven, and, you know, and then you have the stars, and then you have where God lives. God's the third heaven is God's throne. 
And you say, well, why doesn't God mention, you know, his throne, you know, the, the heavens that are his throne, the third heaven, in the creation story? Well, it's because God has always existed, you know, and, and God is not, was never homeless. Like, he's always had a place where he existed. And that would be his, you know, the, the third heaven wasn't, I don't believe was, I believe it's hard to understand or wrap our minds around it, but it's not like when God was going through the creation story and he said, oh, I better make a place for myself as well. It's, you know, God has always existed. And wherever God is, that's heaven. Wherever God is, that's where his throne is. So it also has always existed with him. You know, that's what I believe. It's not mentioned in the story because it pre-existed as the Lord's dwelling place. Okay? And, you know, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. You know, that's that that wall that we run into. It, it's a foolish notion to, you know, to, to bring it up and say, well, you know, where did God come from? Like, well, he's always been. You know, I can't explain it to you. That's just the way God is. And our, our minds can't grasp it. But the Bible does talk about the third heaven. If you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the, uh, Paul, the, I, who I believe the Apostle Paul here is referring to himself, and that's another uh, subject. But he said, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. You know, and a lot of people will, will hypothesize that this is when Paul was stoned to death. You remember that the Jews came and they stoned him and that uh, they thought he was dead. And he probably was at that point. And this is, you know, some people speculate, can't really prove it, that this is when Paul was caught up into that third heaven. He's referring to this. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. You know, that's what makes me think it's Paul. God knoweth. How he was caught up into paradise, which is another word for heaven. Now, you know, that, that's a phrase that dispensationalists should probably pay attention to because they like to teach that paradise, you know, is the nice part of hell, right? Let me just, you know, break your heart. There is no place, nice place in hell. There's, nothing, there's no good side of a place where that, that is meant for eternal torment, okay? Uh, you know, paradise is where? In heaven. And Paul says here he was caught up into heaven. He didn't go down into paradise, okay? So he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So God's throne or is the third heaven, and it is also the highest heaven. You know, that's what it says there in Psalms chapter 8. O Lord, how, uh, o Lord our, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. You know, the glory of God, the glory of his throne, the glory of his dwelling place is above all these other heavens. You know, and no matter how inspired we are by a beautiful sunset, when we look at the heavens of, that, that are in our skies, uh, no matter how profound, you know, we look at the Milky Way, we go out on some starry night, or we see some lightning storm, no matter how inspired we are by those things, we have to remember that God's glory is above that. That, that we can't even begin to, like Paul said, it's, it's not even lawful to utter these unspeakable words. We can't even begin to comprehend the glory that is God's throne, okay? You know, and that's something to look forward to. You know, that's something to always remember that in the Christian life, when the Christian life gets hard or, you know, it's not everything we thought it was going to be cracked, cracked up to be, although I'm, I'm having a good time with it. I think it's pretty exciting to live the Christian life. You know, even when we're in our lowest point, we have to remember that we are, our destination, our home is in God's glory. And we can't even begin to fathom what that's going to be like. The mind can't even comprehend it. I think why he told Paul, why Paul said it's not lawful for a man to utter is probably because of the fact that we just couldn't handle it. You know, and you probably can't even put it into words. And probably a lot of it, God just wants to, it's like Christmas morning. God wants to, you know, there's no guessing about your present. You, can't, you don't get to shake it and figure it out. You know, my, I'm, I don't know if it was my wife or my kids, but they, sometimes they would want to try and guess. I did this as a kid. But then I found out I had an aunt. She guessed every single one of her presents. You know, like the first year she was married to my uncle. She went down and she shook him. It's this. It's this. And you know what? It spoiled Christmas morning for her because she was right about every one of them. Right? So, man, that's kind of the way it is with God, too, in heaven. You know, he gives us just a little, you know, lets us know the gift is there. You know, we, maybe we can see the wrapping a little bit. But the real treasure, the real prize, you know, we don't get to experience that until we get to that highest heaven, that third heaven, which is with God in his throne. You're there in Psalms chapter 7, look, or Psalms 8, just go back to chapter 7, verse 17. It says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. You know, why is God the Most High? No, there's none above him. You know, his throne, his, where he lives, the highest that God, the heaven that God, uh, that God inhabits is the highest heaven. There's nothing above it. 
You know, he has, he has set his glory above everything else. He is the Most High. You know, and that's the God we serve. So he starts out here in Psalms chapter 8, really exalting God and trying to get us to understand that God is high, that God is exalted, that he, there's no glory that compares to him. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that God, is very, God has condescended to man. You know, the, the, the fact that God was manifest in the flesh takes on a whole new meaning when we start to understand how holy and high and lofty the Lord really is. When we understand just how great and, and marvelous God is, when we, when we start to wrap our minds around that and come to an understanding of that, you know, that makes God's condescension to the earth all the more profound. And he kind of starts to talk about this, you know, and the fact that God, who is so high and lofty, even concerns himself with a creature like man, who is sinful and weak, okay? It says in verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. So he's saying here that God has used the babes, of, of, you know, the, the mouth of babes and sucklings, uh, he, he's given them strength. You know, that's who God is using in this earth. He's using not literal babes, not literal sucklings. Obviously, he's being poetic here and figurative. But he's talking about the fact that because of God's enemies, because, because of them, God has chosen to use babes and sucklings to ordain. And that's who he has ordained strength through. Why? So that God receives all the glory for it. And there's so many stories in, in Scripture about that. We see that time and time again. Where God uses, uh, you know, uh, weak men to accomplish great feats through him. To, so that we could all understand and know that God is the one who is to be exalted and not man. And of course, if, uh, you want to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I should have you turn there. Because um, this kind of ties in with it. Okay? So you have in verse 2 of Psalms 8 where God's talking about the fact that babes and sucklings have been given strength because of God's enemies. That's who he's used to defeat his enemies. God did not, you know, it doesn't say because of God's enemies, he's amassed this, you know, elite army, you know, of the special forces uh, to, to go ahead and avenge himself. No, he's used babes and sucklings. He's used what the, the first Corinthians talks about as the weak and base things of the world God hath chosen. Okay. In first Corinthians chapter one, look at verse 20. It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the di disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of, the, of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them but, that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You know, God isn't using the, the noble and mighty people of the earth to, to accomplish his will. And, and he's not meaning this in, a, in an insulting way. It's just the facts. I mean, none of us are, you know, some big shots out in the world. You know, unless some of you are living a double life that I don't know about. Like, maybe, maybe you're keeping the, the, the hidden from me that, you know, you're on some very important board somewhere. I don't know. Like, you know, but we, I, we don't have any presidents. We don't have any senators or, you know, the, what the world would consider a big shot. You know, they don't, they don't associate with this type of church. Well, they might have their churches, their, you know, their token church where they go to so they can, you know, even Obama went to church, so you could tell everybody he was a Christian, and we know, well, that's another sermon. But <coughs> God is using what? The weak and foolish things of the world. Out of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength, right? That's what it says there. It says in verse 27, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, the, the base things and despise things, not by God, but by the world. The world would look at them and say, who are these people? You know, like they said to Ezra, what do these feeble Jews? You know, who do they think they are? They're nobodies. The world would look at us and say, well, you're just, you're nobody. I have be, you're independent. A lot of people don't know what IFB is. You're a Baptist preacher. What does that even mean? You know, you, you just believe some, some old book. Okay. Kind of odd, right? 
But you know what? We're the ones that are accomplishing these things for Christ. You know, we're the ones that God has given strength to to go out and preach the gospel and to compel others to come into his home, to come into his house, to be saved, right? He's saying, look, the base things of the world, the things that are spied hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That, and what is the purpose in all that? That no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, no, none of us are going to get to heaven and, and brag about how great we were and say, oh, man, I led all these souls to, God, to Christ. You know, I preached all these great sermons. Uh, you know, I lived such a godly life for Christ. You know, I, I'm just, I was this most amazing Christian there. Look, anything that we accomplished for Christ in this life was done through Christ. You know, any, any real servant of God is going to get to heaven and, and like the 24 elders around his throne, they're going to take off the crowns that he's given them and cast them at his feet and say, thou art worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. Not us. Who are we? We're nobody. We're the weak. We're the base. We're the things that are despised. We're babes. We're sucklings. We're nobody compared to God. And he's going to, no flesh is going to glory in God's presence. No one's going to say, yeah, God, he saved me, you know, but... I was pretty awesome down there. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <clears throat> That's the whole purpose of this. Why is God ordaining babes? Why is God ordaining the weak and base things? So that God would receive the glory rather than man. And <clears throat> um, if you would, go over to... Uh, uh, well, just, just uh, go over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 147 that God delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. You know, God is not impressed by physical prowess. You know, God's not going to use physic. you know, being physically strong is not what's going to impress God. Now, does that impress the world today? Yeah, the world makes a big deal about that, don't they? About being, you know, the alpha male or whatever. You know, how, and look, there's nothing wrong with keep staying in shape and being strong and all that and, and living a healthy, clean life. That's good. But we should never think in our minds that just because we're so strong physically that somehow God's going to give us preferential treatment. You know, God's not impressed with that. God, you know, like they said of Paul, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is base. And Paul said, well, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, well, we'll see who has power when I show up. You know, and I'll, I'll come with, my, with word and with power. <clears throat> so it's not about, you know, physical stature with God. It's not about that. God uses weak men to do great works for him because God is only interested in humble people. Now, does that instantly out, you know, rule out anybody that has, well, you're too, sorry, you can bench too much. God can't use you. No, that's not, that's not how, I'm not saying that either. But I'm saying God uses, you know, e even the strongest among us to God is, is a weakling. And what God is looking for in people is, is humility. That's who God uses. People who understand, even if they have some physical strength, you know, that they are nothing. I mean, you think about David. He was a great warrior. You know, he accomplished great works. But he understood that he was nobody, that his strength came from God. God uses humble people, you know, people who understand that no matter how strong they are in any area, ultimately they are weak when it comes to God. I mean, think about... Um, you know, think about uh, Moses, you know, who said, you know, that, he, that he, you know, was making all these excuses about he couldn't go and saying, who am I, you know, to go and deliver the children of Israel? Think about, uh, you know, Gideon, right? When the angel came to him and said, thou mighty man of valor, he, uh, you, know, you know, thou mighty man of valor, he says to him. And where was he? He was threshing the wheat. You know, he was down in a gully hiding so the Philistines wouldn't come take his food. You know, he, was, he, was, he wasn't leading some mighty charge. And, and, and even he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. You know, had a very low view of himself. And yet God saw that and said, well, here's somebody I can use because they're not full of themselves, because they have humility. They understand that they are weak, that they are a babe, that they are a suckling, that they are base, that they are the poor and the weak things of this world. That's who I'm going to use so that I'll get all the glory in the end. That's how God works. So we should never get this idea that, you know, well, I'm too this, I'm too weak, or I'm too anything, that God can't use me. Look, the person who thinks they can't be used by God is usually the ideal candidate. But, you know, and it's the complete opposite. The person who just thinks, well, of course God's going to use me. I mean, <laughs> I'm so great. Why wouldn't God use me? Because you have no humility. That's why God's not going to use you. <clears throat> you think about uh, King David, you know. 
when when he when he uh, the, he was given the you know prophesy that this Nathan I believe gave him the the, the prophecy that you know you're going to build your you're, you're going to make the preparations and your son's going to build the great house for me and my glory is going to dwell in it and he, and he prophesied about the temple and then it says and when and and then went King David in and sat before the Lord and said who am I O Lord God and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to he's saying who am I for you to exalt me to that. You know, this, this young, this king who started out just a simple, the youngest in his family, just some shepherd boy who was told, look, you go do the dirty, you go sleep out in the cold, you go stand out in the heat, you go live that lonely life as a shepherd, we're going to go do some real work. You just follow the sheep around. You know, he went from that to the, to the, the, the you know, the greatest king of Israel. And even when he's exalted at his highest, when he's com- defeated all of his enemies, and he's being, you know, told this prophecy about how God is going to honor his request through his son to build him a house. And he said he didn't say, well, it's about time I got some recognition. After all, I'm the one who caught off Goliath's head. It's about time, you know, I appreciate the songs everyone sung, but, I, you know, I need to hear it from God now. That wasn't his attitude. You know, when he heard what God was going to do for him, his reaction was, who am I, O oh Lord God? You know, and that's the person that God uses, the person who's not full of himself, the person who understands that, any strength that they have is given to them of God, that they actual, in all actuality are base and weak. You know, even if they're a mighty king like David. You know, it's in, the world, you know, in the world's eyes, and in, in speaking in worldly terms, yeah, we would look at a person like that say and say, he is mighty. And there would be a grain of truth to that. But in the spiritual sense, you know, there's no one greater than God. <laughs> look at verse 3 of Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. So he goes on to talk about, you know, how great God is and how amazing it is that he's used babes and sucklings to, you know, avenge himself because of the enemy. And then it says, when I can, verse 3, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and had crowned him with glory and honor. He's saying, well, you know, who is man that you... You've you know, given him dominion over your creation. Who are, you know, who are any of us? So, he, you know, what the psalmist is pointing out here, David, is the fact that, you know, God is very condescending. And not in a bad way. You know, sometimes that word has a, a negative connotation today when we say, you know, don't be so condescending. You know, when, when we talk down to people, you know. But when we're talking about God's condescension, we're talking about the fact that, you know, God, who's... who's heaven whose throne is above you know all other heavens who is the most high the fact that he would visit man you know we would say that is quite the condescension for for god to come and visit man and to give man a position in his creation that he has given him to give him dominion over the earth <clears throat> and the fact that god and his kind you know god is not only you know his condescension is not only amazing the fact that he has regarded man in, his, in the fact that he has given him, you know, dominion over his creation, but the fact that God has even condescended so far as to come and dwell among men as a man. <clears throat> Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, because of course Hebrews chapter 2, it, it Hebrews quotes a lot of Psalms, and it quotes this one specifically in, in chapter 2, verse 6. I'll start reading. It says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him, and thou, uh, thou hast made, thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all, uh, put all in subjection under his, him, he left nothing under that is not put under him. But now we see yet not all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all, thi- all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, there's a lot there, and we're not going to unpack all that tonight. But what I want to point out here is the fact that he, you know, the, the Hebrews, or uh, um, Psalms chapter 8, eight it, yeah, yes, there's, there's really two interpretations. There's the fact that we can't apply it to mankind in general, but as you see here in Hebrews, it's applied specifically to Christ. And it's talking about the fact that Christ was made a little lower than the angels. 
and that all things were put on, under his feet, yet yeah, not all things altogether, you know, because he had to suffer and die. You know, not only did God, you know, and, and it's interesting, he said, you know, that he should, uh, he, um, uh, what, what was it there? For it became him for whom, for whom are all things, by whom are all things. You know, Christ condescended to his own creation. You know, Christ was the one that God used to create all things. He himself is not a created being. We know that he is eternally the son of God. But think about that, that, you know, he came and became, he became subject unto his own creation. You know, he allowed all these things to happen. And what was the purpose behind it? Suffering. To bring many sons unto glory, he had to come and suffer and bleed and die for our sins. Look, the, the more we understand how high and lofty God is, the more impact the condescension of Christ and his sufferings will become. And the fact that he came here and, and, and became our captain through sufferings. You know, Christ is an example of humility. And we're all familiar probably with Philippians chapter 2, but if you want to turn there, Philippians chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 4. It says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on, uh, also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that was the mentality of Christ, wasn't it? He didn't mind his own things. You know, he didn't just, he actually concerned himself with the things of others. He concerned himself with the fallen rate, you know, the fallen, fallen man, with the sinfulness of man. He concerned himself with the things of others, the burden of sin that we bore. He came and, and bore for us. <clears throat> it says, and, you know, and, and that's the example that we are to follow. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not ob robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of death as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of, cross, of the cross. And then it goes on and talks about that the God has also, you, you know, he goes through all the suffering, this condescension, this humility, this obedience unto death, but then God also exalts him and gives him a name which is above every name. That the, you know, the, uh, his name that every name, you know, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is God to the glory of the Father. So, he is our example. You know, if we want to be exalted by God, you know, then it's a paradox that we have to become humble. You know, we want to be exalted, then you have to be humble. You want God to use you, then you have to become a servant. <coughs> The Bible says in Romans 12, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to low, men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You know, we should have that same mentality that Christ did, to condescend to men of low estate. And, you know, all, I don't care who it is, the, the greatest, you know, person that we would say, oh, this is the greatest person alive, the, the richest man, the most powerful man on the planet. Yeah, well, compared to God, he's a man of low estate. You know, and God has condescended to all mankind. And, and, and it has considered them, you know. And we should do the same thing. We should never think that, you know, if we reach some station in life, that somehow we're above, you know, reaching out to our fellow man and helping them. You know, thinking, well, you know, I, I, I'm too, you know, I have more important things to do than soul winning. No, you don't. <laughs> That's the example of Christ, reaching out and preaching the gospel. You know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just too busy for that. I'm more important than that. That's, that's the wrong attitude. That's not the example of Christ. You know, I, you know, Christ is pretty important. <laughs> he's somebody. You know, he was, he, you want to talk about somebody who had a position, it's Christ. I mean, he's God. But what did he do? He condescended to men of low estate, to all of us. He concerned himself with others. And we should have that same uh, attitude. You know, in whatever station we achieve in life, we will always be low in comparison to the Lord. And we should always be willing to reach out to others that, you know, the world would, because the world ranks people. Right? The world kind of, you know, they've got the upper class and middle class and the lower class. You know, they're, 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 it's, that's there. You know? And sometimes we can get to a, 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 a place in life or achieve things in life where we start to think maybe we're better than other people. We might have achieved more. Maybe we've worked harder and done things with our life. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we don't lose that compassion for other people and be willing to reach out and help them, preach them the gospel, and, and because that's what Christ did. He's our example. <coughs> and really, you know, it kind of comes back to this, this saying that I, you know, often think about and I've expressed here before, but is that really in the Christian life you have two, 
you have two options. Okay, you have two options in the Christian life, and it's either stay humble or get humbled. Stay humble or get humbled. You know, God's not going to let his children just go through life puffed up, lifted up, thinking that they're better, that, you know, they're, they're too important to concern themselves with, with the lost. He's just not going to do it. You know, God will humble us in one way or another. So the, the better option is just stay humble, you know, because if that's what God's going to do to us anyway, why don't we just spare ourselves the suffering? Why don't we just spare ourselves, you know, God's chastening and just get humble on our own? You know, that, that, that'd be a lot better. It's like I tell my kids at night, hey, look, you can go to bed right now and stay in there and be quiet and go to sleep like you're supposed to without a spanking, or you can act up and, and you know, be a fool, and I can spank you, and then you can still go to bed. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're going to bed one way or another. <laughs> it's going to happen. How do you want to do it? You know, comfortable? You know, where it doesn't, you know, w w without a red behind? Or, or do you want the spanking and then go to bed? It's the same way with us as God's children. God's saying, look, you can humble yourself and serve me and concern yourself with men of low estate like I have, or I can help you with that, you know, and, and humble you. You know, and if we, and the Bible says, he that, hard, he that being often reproved hardened his neck shall be destroyed suddenly and that without remedy. <coughs> if you would, go over to Psalms, back to Psalms chapter 8. We'll wrap it up here. It won't go long tonight. But he says in verse 6, Thou hast made him have dominion over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and all the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. You know, and again, it's worth pointing out that man has dominion over every creature. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if you're received with, 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 uh, with thanksgiving. You know, don't, don't get brainwashed and fall into this idea that man is beneath animals. Okay, that's not what the Bible teaches. O Lord, how, uh, Lord, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So, why, what was the purpose between, you know, I want to close on this thought, is that Yes, we are low in God's sight, but God has exalted man. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. Look, he's put all things under his feet, right? Now, that's also a prophecy of Christ, but it's also talking about here about how man has been exalted in God's creation and all things are subject unto him. But no, you know, he, and, and David here in verses 6 through 8, he reiterates that. He expresses that, that, that man is the superior, you know, we are the top of the food chain. We have dominion over the earth. You know, but does he, does he say that so that we can beat our chest and say, me, man, me, eat everything? You know, that's not, that's not, what he's, that's not the purpose behind it. Look out what it results in. It's God being glorified. He says in verse 9, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He didn't say, how excellent are we? How mighty are we? We're so great. He's saying, look, God gave us glory and honor and has set us above all of his creation. Let's praise him for it. You know, let's give glory to God because of that. God exalted man so that man would exalt God. You know, and, and, you know, we might as well get into this right now. You know, and this is what I understand is some people who don't, you know, Christians who don't want to live for God, that don't want to glorify God in their life. Well, you know, because it, whatever, you know, they've got other things that they're interested in. They think it's boring, whatever. Well, you, you might not like heaven very much then because that's basically what heaven is. Just us glorifying God for eternity. You know, albeit, you know, it'll be in heaven in a glorified body and we'll have work to do. But you know what? We'll be glorifying God. So why don't we just get used to that now? Why don't we just get in the habit of doing that now? Since that's what we're going to be doing for all eternity. Why don't we just learn to glorify God with our bodies, with our minds, with our lives, with our works now? Since that's what heaven is all about. And that's the purpose of God having exalted man anyway. God exalted man so that man would exalt God. <clears throat> you know, creation reminds us of our superior position, but rather it is God, you know, creation, excuse me, as I say this, is that, you know, creation should remind us that we are superior in our position, right? That's true. It's a true statement. But what it, we sh what should remind us of is that God has exalted us and that God will receive the glory for it. Go to, I'll just read to you Revelation chapter 4. I'll just read to you. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, 
and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Look, God created all things for his pleasure. And, and, and God created us. You know, and our purpose in this life and all of eternity is to exalt God and not ourselves. And the God already has exalted us and just, just, by, just by the nature of being mankind, right? But that's, that's not the purpose of it. You know, the purpose behind that is so that we would in turn then glorify God with our lives. So hopefully we'll learn to do that as Christians. You know, hopefully we'll you know, get into that groove since that's kind of the direction, you know, that's the direction we're headed anyway to an eternity of glorifying God. And I think the psalmist here does a really good job of that, of exalting God, showing how great and magnificent God is, then talking about the fact you know, that man also was exalted, but even in that, he's considered a babe, he's a suckling, he, his, any strength he has comes from God anyway. Therefore, he should in turn glorify God himself. Let's go ahead and pray.